Okay, all right, guys, so we're starting now. So uh, this uh, episode is about a very special guest, uh, Parmeshwaran Ayer, uh, who doesn't mind informally being called Param, as he's generally uh, known. Now, Param is a very diverse personality. Uh, he's an author, of course, and uh, here's his wonderful book, in case you haven't seen it. A beautifully written book, a fantastically uh, you know, easy to read, and it just costs slightly over than one rupee a page which, you know, I think uh, it, it is uh, worth at least a hundred times that. So do read it if you get a chance. If you don't, we have Param right here with you, uh, with us. And so you can just sort of plug into this and understand what the book is all about. Uh, so Param is, um, is, is a fitness uh, enthusiast. In fact, uh, his dream was to want to play tennis competitively. And instead, he ended up in the Indian civil service. But nevertheless, he... I did a brilliant job over there and I went on to, uh, you know, helm the Swachh Bharat campaign. And, uh, uh, and as everyone knows, building 100 million toilets in three years is no mean feat, uh, which is something that Param and his team accomplished. And uh, that itself would be significant, but that wasn't enough for him. So once uh, that was uh, done, he's now gone off to the World Bank and he's now heading uh, the global practice over there as the global lead for strategic initiatives in the global uh, water practice of the World Bank. Um, so also on the show, uh, Naina Lal Kedwai needs no introduction. Um, Padam Shri, awardee, uh, previously country head of HSBC, uh, also ex-president of FIKI, which uh, for those who are not from India, uh, it's a big industry body, one of the best, and uh, uh, also uh, now uh, chair of the India Sanitation Coalition and chair of the Advent India Advisory Board. But most important of all, uh, Nana is an author in her own right. And her book is, it's a wonderful book, is Survive or Sink, an Action Agenda for Sanitation, Water, Pollution and Green, green Finance. And it was launched in Delhi, and I remember attending that launch, and Param, in fact, was one of the discussants for a book. So there's a little bit of a quid pro quo going on over here, which, <laughs> which is all for a good cause. Uh, we then have uh, Saili Mankeka, who is a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. And uh, Saili is a recipient of the Ramnath Goenka Award for Civic Journalism. Uh, thereafter, she had changed uh, a course a bit and is now very much immersed in urban affairs. And in the context of this particular discussion, she's actually worked uh, as a part of the uh, team, uh, you know, for Swachh Bharat. And she'll probably tell you more about that. But she continues to be engaged in, uh, you know, uh, on developing entrepreneurship, uh, which is, uh, which facilitates women to enter into the area of uh, including, for example, you know, building a girls' hostel in Mumbai and so on. Sorry, a women's hostel, hostel in, in, in Mumbai. Uh, and uh, finally, we have Ambassador Jayan Gupta. Jayant is a celebrated uh, civil servant. He was our India's ambassador to WTO. Um, he was also secretary of the Prime Minister's advisory, economic advisory council, which is a very high level of think tank and uh, also Secretary Panchayats and Rural Engineering in the government of Bihar. So Jayant is an IS officer exactly like Param used to be. And uh, uh, incidentally, I was also one of the tribe at one time. So Param, let's get down to you. Let's unpack you first, Param the man. Now, workaholic, most certainly. Your day starts at 6.30 and uh, it ends sometimes at 10 or even beyond. But, you know, as I read through your book, oddly enough, what strikes me is that while your days are spent totally focused on work, you actually took two entire years of your life off when you were at the helm of your career in the World Bank um, to, uh, you know, mentor your children, your daughter and your son who wanted to be tennis professionals. How does that fit? I mean, how can a workaholic just take time off and say, now this is family time. You're kind of the ideal, you know, 
work-life balance person. But tell us how it works and where it comes from. And uh, thanks a lot, Sanjeev, and to all the fellow panelists. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's a very good question. And as you yourself mentioned, you know, I had tried a, a couple of careers before I stumbled into the civil service. Wanted to be a professional tennis player. Wasn't good enough. Uh, but tennis was always a passion. And so my kids, you know, they started playing tennis when I was the DM in Bijnor in UP, the collector. And they started developing a sort of a great passion for tennis. And uh, so when one of the reasons for going to Washington, which I've written in the book, is I was actually to improve their chances of, you know, becoming tennis professionals in terms of the training and the coaching uh, they would receive in the U.S. And so Tara, my daughter, and Venkat, my son. So they took up tennis very, very seriously when we were in Washington. They had an excellent coach, a Finn called Vesa Ponka. And I've used one of his uh, sayings as a pro tip in the book. So there came a stage when Tara wanted to play professional tennis and she needed a road manager. You know, that term was coined by a colleague in the bank. And she needed someone who would be both a manager on the road, but also a coach, because we couldn't afford to get a full-time coach. So the timing was important. And, you know, like I've mentioned in the book, you've got to kind of seize the moment. So uh, when Tara was 17, it was time for her to, you know, to start playing professional tennis. And so I resigned from the World Bank. I remember my boss telling me, listen, if you leave now and if you ever come back, you'll go back to the end of the line, which I did actually. So uh, for me, it was just pure fun. Both my wife, Indira, and I, who's actually kind of borne the brunt of all my frequent uh, transfers and changes in location. So we started managing our kids' tennis. We traveled with them. And I think it was the most fun period of my career, you know, just being a road manager to Tara. Even now, most of my friends know me as Tara's dad because, you know, I've, I've been with her to Nigeria, to China, to different parts of Indonesia. And I think there were tremendous learnings in that, but more than anything else, it was just good family time. And I still remember reading a book by Akio Morita, the guy who founded Sony. And when someone asked him at the end of his fabulous career, what do you really regret the most? And he said, I didn't spend enough time with my family. So I was very fortunate. I managed to spend time with my family in the middle of my career. Yeah. Param, uh, second question from me, that you know, chance sort of figures very heavily in your life. You end up joining the IS by chance. You end up coming to Delhi very early in your career, which is you know, five years under your belt to, to Delhi as the private secretary to Minister Arun Singh. And uh, you get plucked out of Bijnor quite against your will and end up by chance in Lucknow. And, you know, you, you end up with this project that has thereafter excited you for the rest of your life, the Swajal project, which was going on in UP at the time. So it, it appears as a chance has, has, been, has been very predominant in your life. But then that is completely at variance with, you know, how you are in, in your daily life, where you leave nothing to chance. With you, everything works like a machine. I mean, look at you. You were 20 minutes early for this particular <laughs> discussion. You left nothing to chance. So how do the two, you know, uh, exist within you at the same time? How do look, you it's, it's a fascinating question, Sanjeev. I never thought about it, actually. And, you know, and you're right, because one of the, you know, how the chapters or the subtitles in my book is called Stumbling into a Specialization, right? You know, I just stumbled into water and sanitation. So it actually, that actually happened by chance. But I think the other lesson which sort of complements that or explains it is seizing the moment, you know, carpe diem. And I think there's an opportunity for everyone. And everyone goes through, you know, gets a chance. It's whether you kind of seize the moment or not, I think, which is really important. And for me, perhaps the most dramatic uh, instance of carpe diem was when uh, your batchmate, actually, Sanjeev, uh, Vijayalakshmi Joshi, resigned. <laughs> and so there was a vacancy in the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation. If she, I mean, if she hadn't resigned, there was no question of you know, my ever having uh, come back to the government of India. So I, I, I have to say I was very lucky. And so... Perhaps I've been luckier than most, so chance has played a major part. But I think it's also very, very important 
to seize those opportunities and make the most of them. And that's what I've tried to do. I've been uh, lucky in many cases, unlucky in some. So I think you've got to take both the failures and the successes. And uh, I think many, many of us do that. So Parab, let's uh, jump from the past to what you're doing today, the present. Uh, you're today the global lead sitting in the World Bank. And you know, you've just completed this enormous project in India. I mean, I'm not sure, but is it the world's largest project ever rolled out? And particularly the manner in which it has been rolled out in you know, the community participative style, uh, which is actually a role model for the way all governments should go in the future, not just for sanitation and water, but probably for a whole host of uh, reform efforts. So my question is that, to what extent are you able to translate the Indian experience? You know, we like to export stuff too, right? I mean, we're service exporters in India, right? We don't export much manufactured goods, but we do a lot of service exports. So this would be, you know, sort of an intellectual service support to the rest of the world. Like what were the lessons that you learned over here in this enormous endeavor of yours, which you're actually applying globally? Uh, no, thank you for asking that, Sanjeev. In fact, some of the lessons we learned in India, particularly during the implementation of the Swat Bharat mission, we had already started exporting, to use your term, to other countries during my tenure in the government of India. So, for example, coming out of the, the International Sanitation Convention we organized in October 2018, when the Secretary General of the UN made his first visit to India, and together with Prime Minister Modi, they addressed 55 sanitation ministers from around the world. The minister from Nigeria, uh, Minister Adamu, he came to India. He was so uh, influenced by what was going on in India that he went back to Nigeria and they started the Clean Nigeria campaign. In fact, he's written a chapter about this in uh, the earlier book, which I edited. So I think some of those lessons were already being shared. And actually, we like to think there were four major lessons learned then, which we are using now globally. The first was politically, we call them the four Ps. The first was political leadership. The first time the Prime Minister of India, you know, ever had championed the subject as kind of lowly, if you want to call it that, as sanitation and made it a stock program. So that political leadership at the highest level, public financing for a public good, you know, more than $20 billion was spent on sanitation for the first time. The finance minister, Mr. Jetley, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, they invested in sanitation. Uh, the third was partnerships, you know, working with India Sanitation Coalition under Nana's leadership, uh, who crowded in the private sector, uh, working with NGOs, working with development organizations. And lastly, the fourth P, perhaps the most important, people's participation. How this program under the Prime Minister's leadership became a Jan Andolan. So those lessons, Sanjeev, now, my job today, I'm focusing on universal access to water sanitation and hygiene. And we're looking at taking those lessons to other countries. So Nigeria, there's a big $700 million loan, which is currently being prepared. I was doing a, I had joined the final decision meeting today, early morning. Uh, Nigeria, Kenya, a lot of countries in Africa, but also in East Asia. So many of those lessons of the importance at a policy level of why is it important to invest in sanitation using an evidence-based approach, right? And making the case for sanitation, that's part of my job. And also uh, the other part, which I'm sort of bringing here is that experience of managing supply chain and logistics during the lockdown in India. And that's coming in handy in the overall, the World Bank's COVID response, where I'm a part of the vaccine task force and we're looking at the readiness of countries, not just to, to supply the vaccines, but to actually vaccinate people. And so that I'm helping them there as well. So a lot of these experiences, which I picked up in India, not just, I would say, especially in the last four and a half years, but also which all of us learned throughout our career in the civil service, I think they're really useful in other developing countries. And part of the job of the bank, as you know, because you've worked there yourself, is it's not just a money bank, but it's also a knowledge bank. And to spread that knowledge and make sure that you know countries have the capacity to implement those lessons. That's part of my job. Okay, thank you, Naina. Can I request you to take over? Uh, very happy to, uh, Sanjeev. 
Param, uh, you are such a tough act to comment on. Uh, I have to start by saying that every time I hear about how wonderfully you managed uh, as a family man and as uh, the hardworking government official I knew, uh, it puts me on a guilt trip. But uh, let's let's uh, <laughs> we shouldn't focus on that because I will not recover from it easily. You know, I think uh, uh, what you brought uh, to your work, and I, I'm glad that it's there's some reflection of it in the book, but I would love to have you speak more about, is the professionalism that you brought to your office. So I have to tell you that when I started the India Sanitation Coalition, which just about predated the Prime Minister Modi's uh, uh, amazing uh, announcement at Red Fort that Independence Day, the part of it I was dreading was the interaction with government. And I thought we'd be pushing against this closed door, which we would have to batter down. And what you indeed created was an open door, which was not just an open door, but a fabulous partnership. Uh, we struggled to get the corporate sector in. I mean, they were just more engaged in things to do with education and some of the old stuff they had been working on. And if it wasn't for you, I do not believe we would have got the corporate sector into thinking about the criticality of sanitation and hygiene and what it brings. Uh, the Tata Fellows, uh, that you were able to conceive of a program which brought young, talented people into where they, they were needed, but also has built a force who I hope will stay in sanitation as they move off from their fellow programs. Uh, so just the way you conceptualize these things, uh, how you were able to persuade uh, the Tata uh, uh, group to come in to that program was just uh, wonderful. But I think for, for the lesson that I hope that every uh, secretary in the government learns is how to engage with many like us, you know, sort of quasi NGO, corporate as we were, in terms of how pleasant that experience was, the breakfast meetings, the conversation on the telephone, the no need for formality of coming and checking into a, a government office, which believe me is, has got to be through my career, one of the, the experiences I dislike most, the whole process of having to do it unproductive, sitting around waiting rooms, waiting for meetings to happen. I mean, uh, it's, it's great that you brought this refreshing Private sector, I respect your time approach to, to this. And I do hope that that is a lesson that uh, many will take from that book. Uh, always consider it. And most of all, you were a sector and are a sector expert. I always came away from meetings with you having learned more than I could ever bring into that meeting. And that was something, therefore, that one always looked forward to. So let me ask you, because it's so important for us, for everything you created, the institutions that you built, what is it that you believe those of us on the ground working in sanitation and water need to focus on uh, as uh, you look to ensure that the success that you created here continues? And I thank you very much, Nana. Look, it was a real privilege to work with you and the coalition. You know, for us, coming in, for me especially, this was a ready-made platform which you had developed. You know, it took you a lot of hard work to bring those four, 500 members together, the, you know, all the corporate CEOs at the highest level. So that ability, so for me, it was another case of, you know, seizing the moment. I mean, I would have been a fool not to leverage that phenomenal network, talent, expertise, which you had already created. I remember, you know, when I was working in the bank uh, many years ago, we started a public-private partnership for hand washing with soap, where we had the big soap companies who were interested in selling soap, but the bank and governments were interested in public health. And we know the hand washing with soap saves lives. And I remember uh, a meeting with McKenzie in London. We wanted them to manage this for us. And uh, all of you know that, you know, Nana is the first lady MBA from Harvard. You know, she's the management guru. We met these people at, and we had three meetings with them. And then they said, listen, we, we're not dealing with you guys. Nothing moves in the World Bank, the public sector. We have a three meeting rule. I still remember that. And if, if it's not going to move, nothing moves forward after that, we stop engaging. And I remember that. And I knew that 
in the private sector time is money even more than it is for us in the public sector and uh, i realized from then onwards that if i was to engage have the opportunity like i had uh, working with you guys you know we need to be responsive we need to you know work on time and we look we are tapping into your expertise and for us if you are helping us we are not helping you we are, and it's all about the partnership it's about achieving the goal so when i came in and i realized that there was this phenomenal platform the india sanitation coalition i remember telling my team so guys are you working with them they said no no sir you know that some private sector organization etc and then when i met you uh, you know i realized that this can be huge value added so as far as i was concerned there was a mission we had a time frame we needed to deliver and we needed all hands on deck and when we started engaging with the pros like you guys uh, i would have been a fool not to have engaged and it's frankly been my style to engage in an informal manner because i feel that you know that those meetings at the most value you get the best knowledge and you get the business done and on the tata trust it's a great question uh, again we got a little lucky i have to confess sanjeev but i seized the moment so initially i was very keen on this because uh, i knew that district collectors are very busy right they chair a hundred committees they keep uh, you know having things dumped up on their plate so i needed the attention of the district collector i wanted the collector to focus on on this program i mean despite all the political push on the ground the, we needed to activate the pm cm dm formula how do you get the dm excited and motivated and then i thought that if we can get a young professional in every district in india who's only doing swachh bharat and is the eyes and ears of the district collector but also monitoring and reporting back to us that would make a big difference all around so initially uh, i remember discussing it with nana and, and you know we got some corporates nana got them on board and they said okay we can do 15 we can do 20 but you know then we thought listen this the transaction cost is too much and so we discussed it with nana and we said let's approach the tata trust and uh, we went to the tata trust uh, venkat was the executive trustee at the time he went to mr ratan tata and they said fine so they gave us 550 young professionals and uh, we put one in every district by that time a few had already become open defecation free they made a huge difference they brought in energy into the program uh, they brought in creativity they brought in communication and uh, many of them stayed on and uh, that program i think made a very big difference but it was all about engaging with the private sector and uh, adding some value uh, to the relationship by being very very practical frank and open and param you have to tell us what we have to continue doing on the ground now no absolutely nana so right now uh, you know before i left we had got swachh bharat phase 2 approved Uh, so now the focus is going from odf open defecation free to odf plus which is a broader definition of of sanitation is looking at solid and liquid waste management as well and and what nena you have been you taught me all along is how do you make sanitation a market and a business to sustain it so and i'm sure saili has got a lot of experiences on that uh, again how do you bring in rural entrepreneurs particularly women you know we saw a lot of rani mistries in jharkhand where they themselves became masons but to really sustain the outcomes of the swachh bharat mission you need to continue that behavior change communication people need to continue to use their toilets but also they need to have uh, you know solid waste earlier an urban problem then a peri urban problem is now also becoming a rural problem plastic waste management etc so the big focus of swachh bharat phase 2 is on that and i would say naina uh, you know arun baroka is running the program now the addition secretary and it i think you are the role of the sanitation coalition is even more important today is how do you come up with business models for local entrepreneurs to make a living out of solid waste and liquid waste management because i think that's really the way to go to bring in credit uh, so to you know you're you're the original uh, credit person with all your incredible banking management experience so i think there's a very big role to play today and i'm sure you're continuing to do that thanks param and all i can say is it's not chance it was our luck as a country fortunately and 
God up there that made sure that you came in to everything that uh, has benefited us in water and sanitation. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you, Naina. That gives us a wonderful segue into you know what Saili Mankeka can uh, tell us about what it looked like from the bottom up, and particularly on the entrepreneurship and the enormous uh, love for a passion you know that you transmitted to all those thousands, if not more than almost lakhs, a hundred thousands of people that you touched and probably continue to touch today. And we hope this video will be watched by all of them. <laughs> Silent. Thank you, Alu Alia, sir. Um, uh, Paran, sir, I mean, uh, we got like ORF and, you know, personally, I got involved with the Swachh Bharat mission on a very exciting program. Uh, and I really did not expect a central government kind of a mission to come up with a hackathon. And that too for sanitation. I mean, it was quite fascinating. And uh, to kind of you know, crowdsource ideas on sanitation and toilets. And, and, and we had the spectrum, like a 15 year old giving in an idea and a 60 year old giving in an idea. I mean, you got like, you know, the two P's that I could take away from your previous comment was partnerships and people's uh, participation. I would like to concentrate a bit on, you know, the younger minds that you actually ignited through this program and coming back to what Ms. Nana said. Uh, was uh, one very interesting experience that I would like to kind of put forth. Well, I had traveled to Jawahar, which is in Thane district, and one of your prayerak was there. And, uh, you know, I witnessed this meeting when there were about 70 people listening to this 22-year-old sitting next to the collector on their next steps on sanitation in, in, in Jawahar. I mean, how phenomenal can that be? And I followed... Uh, you know, up on what this guy is doing today. And he has his own uh, entrepreneurship cell that he has formed. And he's just 25. And he's, I think, it's like feeding into the Atmanirbhar Bharat narrative in some way. My question would be, and you know, someone like me, I mean, I'm not that young, but you know, to get a chance to have your little, uh, you know, input into such a big mission, and creating uh, a sense of, uh, you know, uh, belonging to a program like sanitation. How do you think we can, you know, we should, or what are your thoughts on institutionalizing such frameworks? Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, Sally, that's a, that's a great question because it was something which, you know, we, we sort of started thinking about a little later after we, you know, introduced the program. Because initially, uh, as I said, the thought was how do we bring in sort of young energy, young creativity in the districts, you know, to really charge up this program and make it go well beyond some kind of Sarkari Yojana. So it was very interesting when uh, these uh, youngsters were recruited, they came from very interesting backgrounds and uh, you would have seen that for yourself. We had people from IIMs, we had people, we had, there was one from an IIT. So we had very well educated youngsters and they came in for very different reasons. One of them was telling me, because I used to do an orientation for them in Delhi, then we would you know, arrange training for them and I would meet them very often. One person said, I just want to hang out with the collector, you know, because we said, you're going to be the eyes and ears of the collector. And uh, people came from abroad. So it made a lot of difference to us. It gave us a lot of energy. So it was a kind of two-way thing. Then, uh, and initially, you know, Radha, whom you know very well, my joint secretary, an outstanding officer who organized the hackathon, which you helped her with. So she was in charge of the prayers. And she would get like 200 emails every day from everyone saying, I want to do this. Why can't we do this? And the collector is not doing this. And, you know, how do we uh, move forward? And she was sort of, you know, like a principal of a college for her in the beginning. It was quite chaotic. And there was a sort of an outburst of energy and enthusiasm. So, uh, but that really, I think, kept the program fully charged and made a very big difference. Now, many of them, so the original idea was they would spend uh, 18 months to 24 months. And then, it, you know, they would come and get some field experience. Many of them wanted to use that for, your, for their resume, apply for higher studies abroad and so on. Some of them stayed on for three years, four years. And a lot of them have now gone elsewhere. So the alumni of the products, you know, the half of them are in Niti Ayo, they're all over the place. And then we got a fresh batch. But in terms of institutionalizing, which you said, I think it's really important. 
And in fact, uh, some of the other ministry, the National Nutrition Mission, the Portion Mission is trying to do this now. And frankly, it was an idea which we borrowed from Amitabh Kant in the Niti Aayog. He had a lot, lot of young professionals. Of course, they were all mainly based in Delhi. But I think that it is really important now. And it's something which I've discussed with Amitabh and others. Is how do we bring in, because the, the young blood in the field to sort of get involved and get their hands dirty in these huge programs, which require a lot of energy on the ground. And I think here, a couple of things, uh, which you know I've discussed with Nena as well. I think the corporate sector can really help here. So, uh, you know, because typically in government, it's not so easy to recruit people. We were fortunate that the Tata Trust did the entire recruitment. They paid their salaries. Uh, they handled everything. Uh, we just deployed them. We trained them. We motivated them. They were part of our team, of course. So I think it's an opportunity for the corporate sector to come forward in other programs. And, uh, you know, programs which are time bound, which really need some boots on the ground. I think it's an opportunity. I would, what I would feel is that, uh, you know, someone like Amitabh Kant, who's already doing it in the aspirational district program, you know, he's the person I think Niti Ayo can take this forward. They're also the nodal point of coordination with the corporate sector for the government of India. But I think it's a very, very important uh, reason for the success of the Swaj Bharat mission and getting youth, particularly in rural areas, involved in these missions is critical. And actually we took it one level below. The Prerics were, of course, all college graduates and they were at district level. But another idea, actually an interesting idea, I've written about it in the book. Uh, I got it from Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who was a bit of a critic of the program. And I went and met him. And so he asked me, uh, so what, I, you guys talk a lot about behavior change. And you know, is it all just talk or are you just building toilets? I said, no, we're doing it. And he said, how? And I said, okay, there's a mass media part. And then there is interpersonal communication. There are village motivators. And the PM gave them this fantastic name of Swacha Grahi. So he said, listen, that's a strong narrative. Why don't you get more grassroots volunteers train them, then you can reasonably say that you're doing interpersonal behavior change on the ground. So we recruited six lakh Swacha Grahis and they're all local village youth. Uh, some of them are Anganwadi workers, some are Asha workers. They get an honorarium for making a village ODF. But I think that it's not an employment, it's not a job, but it's, it's motivation, it's being involved with a huge mission, it's getting trained, it's getting recognized. And I think that's another aspect how we kind of drilled down and created that cadre at the village level as well. So I think it's really important to continue to institutionalize that. We have tried to do it in Swaj Bharat phase two. Now we're turning a little bit more towards looking at local entrepreneurs, which I know is an area of your specialization, to make sanitation a business and not just on a voluntary basis. So that's going to be a big effort, but I think that's the direction which we need to go. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Shaili, you don't have a follow through to that. So should we go on? No, I, my only follow up was, would be to ask, so have behavior changed really on ground? <laughs> I mean, okay. that would be the follow up question. It's a big, Look, it's a I mean, it's question. big. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. I would say for the most part it has. And, uh, you know, I mean, then you can look at it uh, in a couple of ways. I think that uh, there was recognition that village communities got excited about their village. You know, there was a sense that we've got to make our village. There was a, there was social pressure. And I think that was part of what the Swachagrahis could ignite. They could trigger, that term came into the jargon. They triggered behavior change. So there was a sense of excitement. You had school children in uh, East Champaran coming out on the streets and saying, Moje Shochale Chahiye. And led by the collector, Raman Kumar. I remember uh, ringing up Jayanto and telling him, listen, this is really exciting. It's going on in, in Bihar. I think there was, there definitely was behavior change. Uh, and what is the proof of that, right? Usage of toilets. Now, there were three annual surveys under the World Bank uh, support project. Usage in all the surveys, 100,000 households, was about 90%. Now, you've got to work at it. It's a dynamic process, right? You will never have a perfect situation. There will be situations where toilets were built and not used. So I think that behavior change 
the vyavahar parivartan as we used to call it that took place for the most part but you have to keep working at it that's one of the the difficulties of this job or any job uh, you, you know there's no mission accomplished in this business you have to keep working at it and so that behavior change that campaign that excitement that needs to be maintained and it's very difficult so sustaining odf uh, is a key part of swat bharat phase 2 to sustain that behavior change it's challenging but i think they're working at it and now that the 15 finance commission is giving funds for sanitation water directly to panchayats those funds can be effectively deployed right nana did you want to say something or did i read you wrong no okay so let's go on to jayan then uh jay um you are a batchmate of parul that must have been tough you know to be the batchmate <laughs> of icon <Nikon>. very tough <laughs> any thoughts on that no it was <laughs> you know it was a real pleasure because he brought a breath of fresh air to to the batch gatherings to uh, the interactions and he had a, a quite a different outlook on life when he joined uh, in masuri in 1981 he was uh, just uh, 22 he'd been on a tennis scholarship to the us i had not known what a tennis scholarship was before that and uh, when he came back he used to have this uh, very engaging trait of asking questions about everything why should we do this why can't we do it this way so that trait was very visible uh, even in those days that he had a questioning mind and he always thought of doing things the uh, in another way um, having said that uh, since uh, i think we have uh, just a little over perhaps 5 minutes or so i would uh, like to uh, start off with a cliche behind every successful man there is a woman and uh, i am obviously pointing to uh, indira who is incredibly talented in her own right she was a journalist she was an lic officer she has been in the income tax service and she has had six changes of career partially because param was moving around from one place to another one job to another now she has been the real rock uh, of support in the family structure and uh, i was just like to ask param that uh, you know don't you think it was uh, more than luck the kind of uh, sacrifices that uh, indira has made for the family and for us to have you back uh, in uh, india to head the swachh bharat mission that was uh, i think a tremendous contribution which has perhaps uh, not uh, been really acknowledged very much in the public domain no janto absolutely and uh, you know janto has had to put up with me for a very long time but he spot on about indira i mean this writing this book was entirely her idea the title is her idea and uh, as jayanto said she's been uh, you know the rock in the family's life she's uh, given up a lot of things uh, herself uh, you know just to keep the family together and when we were all going nuts on the tennis tour you know she would say she was the only sane person in the family and uh, nana has also met her and uh, of course jayant and arundhati jayant's wife and family they know us really well so indira has played a key role all through she's the one who told me to do an mba she said listen you're just a you know you're a ba honors in english literature what are you going to do get you know get a degree man she told me so you know she's a phd in economics i did an mba and then uh, critical stages and she's been sort of my best friend and sternest critic you know there was um, one part in the book i write about where in a function in champaran you know the prime minister said some kind things about me uh, in that public function and so as i was driving back from uh, motihari to patna on that road i got i got two frantic calls from indira she said listen just lie low now shut up and don't utter a word you know people are going to be extremely jealous about what the prime minister said so just lie low and you know she's always made sure that you know i never started i thought too much of myself she's kept my feet firmly on the ground but great strategic advice in the book the white board behind me marking the number of days i have on the job and the number of entirely indira's idea she said listen 
you've got my i had a two year contract when i came she said you've got a limited number of days you better make sure that every day counts so that then taking care of the kids homeschooling them i mean you know taras uh, did a phd in economics all due to indira you know venkat my son uh, again so she's put in a massive effort and uh, what jan says is more than true so uh, no question about it the uh, second follow up question is about a bit of the madness uh, that you have alluded to in the title of the book you know just for the uh, sake of uh, informing the viewers uh, both his children are also academically incredibly grift- gifted uh, tara uh, made it uh, to harvard as well as duke and uh, param told me about it and uh, tara uh, chose duke instead of harvard and i asked him the reason he said because it has a better tennis team and i said you are mad tara is mad and then i talked to indu and i tried to talk them out of it but of course uh, indu had to go with the majority opinion so that is the kind of madness that uh, prevailed in those days in uh, param's uh, family uh, but uh, thank god uh, for his single minded dedication to whatever cause he took up uh, one last uh, question uh, uh, rather two questions one of them is that uh, you very successfully for instance albeit for a very brief while led a total literacy campaign in bijnor which gave you the chance to see things for yourself uh, you know how you can motivate people and then people's participation and of course you got uh, transferred out very soon on some other unrelated issue then you had four years in the swachh bharat abhiyan swajal as uh, it was then called in up and there it was a very very successful mobilization of uh, the people and it became a demand from the people now what kind of uh, experience uh, that you had there helped you in building up in the world bank especially when you went to egypt lebanon later on in vietnam that experience must have been uh, you know must uh, be worth its weight in gold about motivating local communities uh, encouraging them having a sense of competition built into them so your thoughts on this sure uh, but before that i've got to tell you another uh, i don't know if it's mad or not uh, another uh, you know achievement i would say of mine you know jain's son uh, his younger son was is an iit graduate and then uh, joined you know like many iit boys joined went to deutsche bank and he was then keen to join the civil services and jento was talking him out of it he said no 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 doesn't make any sense and uh, i remember anish having a long talk with me so jen said okay you talk to param and see what he says and i said absolutely you know so uh, and that might have been one of the factors his son resigned his job came back studied for the exam and got in and now he is in the west bengal cadre uh, outstanding youngster married to a ips batchmate so you know i'm sort of semi responsible for that as well but uh, coming back to your question jayanto yeah you know i think a couple of things i learned from both from bijnor and from the swajal project which stood me in good stead in the bank the first was i think the power of a community driven approach unless you get the community the families the locals involved and incentivize and motivate it to participate it's not going to work it's not going to stick it will never be sustainable that we learned from bijnor where we were trying to get uh, you know girls between the age of 15 and 35 and women educated and all of us have done that uh, program i'm sure alu's done it as well the sampurna sakshata abhiyan and uh, i've written about it a little bit in the book and then the swajal program i think two things i learned from swajal uh, similarly getting communities involved getting them to manage that's the first time i saw women from the hills of pithoragarh coming to jindal pipe factory in ghaziabad buying pipes pvc pipes for water and taking it back themselves because they controlled the money so i realized that if you put them in charge give them access to finance make them manage programs it's going to be much more effective because it's you know in their to their benefit the other thing i really learned from swajal was the importance of creating a good team 
I found that absolutely critical and I refer to that in the book. And that experience of you know, handpicking people. If you, are, if you have the luxury of that, you've got to be a little lucky, as we all know, because, you know, you can get people dumped upon you. I've somehow, I had a fantastic secretary, Indrani Sen, the late Indrani Sen, and she gave me carte blanche to go out and get anyone I wanted. So I had a fantastic team. And that core team made a big difference. So I used that same model wherever I went, whether it was in the World Bank, we developed that program in Vietnam, and I've written about creating that dream team to prepare the first uh, results-based financing program in Vietnam. So I think that was the other lesson. But I think the one thing which gave me a lot of confidence when working in the bank was my field experience. There's no substitute for that. And Alu has worked a lot in the bank. He knows that as well. Uh, I mean, you can come in with a PhD in economics from Harvard and uh, you know, join the Young Professions Program. And, but that experience on the ground of working at the grassroots of understanding the sort of political economy of how things move and not, that is really useful anywhere. So in the World Bank, whether it was in Egypt or Lebanon or Vietnam, the ability to understand the political economy issues, to engage with government. And, you know, the bank is essentially lends to sovereign countries, to governments. So when your counterparts know that you used to be a, a, a civil servant, it makes it that much easier to engage with them because they understand that you understand their constraints. So I think those experiences gave me a lot of confidence, although it took a bit of time to become a sort of quote unquote water and sanitation professional. But I think that Swajal experience was very handy. And I soon started holding my own in, uh, in the sort of international arena in the sector as a kind of water and sanitation person. Okay. One last question. If you permit, Sanjeev? Uh, we are kind of a little out of time. Okay. So let me uh, take the final cut here. And, uh, you know, one thing you mentioned here that I'd really like to follow up on. So it's a more basic issue, Param, that, you know, your family, you and your family are so good at it, that whatever you did, you did as a family. And I'm again reminded of the time when Nana's book was released. And, you know, the comment that the publisher made was that, yes, Naina has written the book, but this has been a family enterprise. Everybody has worked on it. And this is a lesson that's come home to us so strongly during the epidemic, that, you know, there is no such thing as a single, uh, you know, a singular accomplishment. Everything is bound into what the fan family can do. So maybe, Param, that gives you food for thought for starting a different kind of a program at the global level, which integrates all actors in the family. The community, yes, of course, but I think the epidemic has made us realize how important family is and how, how relatively less provided are those people who don't, those unfortunates who don't have one. And maybe so we can make a different kind of a family from them. Any uh, quick thoughts on that before we end? No, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, I, I very much remember uh, joining Nana's book launch panel. In fact, it was our birthdays, right? So Nana and I share a birthday, the 16th of April. So, uh, you know, very pleasantly surprised when Rashid, Nana's husband and great supporter, you know, they uh, took out a birthday cake when the thing ended and we all cut the cake together. But absolutely, just like Nana's family, I think Jayanto's family, I'm sure all families, uh, they play a critical role. And it's quite tough during the pandemic. I'm seeing that here in the US as well, when everything is virtual, you know, at least in India, we used to work from office till I left in August. Here, the World Bank office is shut down and we're going from one virtual meeting to another. And I think the importance of family has been emphasized even more now during the pandemic. And it's been quite challenging for many people, but there's no question that, that work-life balance, that family support, is absolutely critical if you if you want to have an uncluttered mind and focus on your work. Uh, it makes a very big difference. So totally agree with you. That's it then for today. Uh, so the main takeaway from today's session with Param, uh, Naina, Saili, and Jayanto are that is that you know everybody gets the main chance. The key issue, however, is that are you able to identify it? And once you identify it. Do you have the guts to run with it like Param did? That's it, Karan. Okay, that's it then, guys.
Um, thank you so much, everybody. So we've got a little over time. Nana, I hope I haven't held you up. Parun, thank you. It's, I don't know what hour it is for you, but you never <laughs> sleep. So I, you know, and Jen, so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjeev. Thank you. Thank you.